My name is Nathan Rohr. My wife, Amber, uh, and family, we've been attending FBK for about six years. Uh, we have seven kids. I'm sure you've seen uh, them either <laughs> running around in the hallways or we take up a full row uh, over in the back. But um, they range from the ages of uh, 23 to 9. And uh, my wife and I attend the, uh, the FIT3 Sunday school class uh, first hour, and then uh, we split our time either uh, in here for the second hour or uh, teaching uh, the two-year-olds, and I do use uh, teaching two-year-olds uh, very, very loosely. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, pre-COVID, we also helped uh, out with an adoption uh, and fostering support group, and uh, that's something that we are um, working on bringing back. So I uh, ask you guys to you know, pray, and if God is putting on your hearts uh, to possibly look into that, we would love to have you uh, attend that. So, uh, but let's get, in, let's get into the Word. So we're going to be reading uh, and studying in Ephesians 4, uh, 1 through 7. So if you'll stand with me uh, in honor of the reading of God's holy word, I'll give you a few seconds uh, to get into that or to scroll through your app uh, to open that up. Uh, Paul's writing on the unity uh, in the body of Christ. Ephesians 4, 1 through 7. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in the manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. May God add the blessing to the reading of his word as Patrick preaches uh, on the words that God has laid on his heart. You may be seated. Thanks, Nathan. Here we go. Let me take that with me. You take it with you. Right. It'll keep making noise like that. Well, good morning. Everybody doing okay this morning? Had plenty of coffee? Got your seatbelt on? You ready to go? All right, if you have your Bible open to Ephesians 4, put your finger there and turn to the left to Exodus 18. We're going to spend some time in the Old and the New Testaments. So we're going to be in the book of Acts, the book of Matthew, maybe Ephesians 4 at some point. I say that, in, I say that jokingly, but today is, is a very important day in the life of our church. And why would I say that? Because today is the Lord's Day. We get to gather together and celebrate what he has done. We get to study the word together. We get to sing songs to him, and we get to pray to him. And all of those are acts of worship. If you have your Bible open to Exodus 18, put your finger in verse 10. And I want to give an understanding or an explanation. This sermon series that we're in, looking at the way forward as a church, this sermon title today is A Vision for Leader Multiplication. So some of us would say, well, this doesn't sound all that exciting. I promise you it is. It's a lot of fun. It's exciting to embrace the reality that God has called a people together. If you are in Christ, he has placed you in his body, big B, little b, lowercase b, or lowercase c church here at First Baptist Kettering today on purpose. He has a message for each and every one of us today, including myself. So as we see in Exodus 18 in just a few moments, that leader multiplication is something that has been on the heart of God since the beginning of his people, since the beginning of creation, this idea that there would be people that are raised up, gifted, and equipped to lead. But as we see in Ephesians 4 later, there are some challenges to that. And I would submit to you right at the very beginning that leader multiplication, as you see this vision for how we grow as a church, how we multiply leaders, has everything to do with our disciple making as a church and as individuals. I would say that where disciple making is missing, you will see a lack of leaders popping up. If there's a lack of leadership in the local church, there's a lack of discipleship in the local church. And what we're going to get into this morning in Exodus chapter 18 is this engagement between Moses and a guy that would bring him some challenges, but is also very important in his life. Exodus chapter 18, beginning in verse 10, we'll begin reading here. Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. So there's the first 
set of, of words that we see from Exodus 18, in Exodus 18, to Moses from an interesting character in his life, his father-in-law. Now, I look across the room. How many of us have ever been, uh, been in a conversation with our in-laws or parents that didn't go so well? Come on, get them up. This is, this is a safe, safe place. 400 of your best friends in the room. Okay, so this is a very interesting engagement because Jethro is his father-in-law who, who comes to see Moses and on his way, he recognizes a couple things. God has done an amazing, amazing work. And as Moses, as Jethro begins to engage him, he offers praise where praise is due in verse 10. But can you imagine just for a moment, you are the guy who's led an entire nation of people away from captivity. And you're spending time with these people. And, and you know the story, if you've been in the scripture at all, that Moses and the people didn't really have a great journey together. Some of them grumbled, right? They weren't happy with him. They challenged his leadership, his decision making. There were questions about his ability. When, when God called Moses, what did Moses say? Surely someone more capable, Lord, because I'm, I'm, I'm slow of speech and tongue. I stutter. I'm not confident. My confidence in your calling me is not really that, that sure. And God said, I will be with you. And he sends people with Moses to do the thing he's called him to do. So God equips the leader he's called, although it's not necessarily the one that everybody would agree was the most equipped. God did the equipping. So here's point number zero, because there's no point for this. You won't find it in your notes. But God equips those he calls. So I want to challenge us this morning as we sit here and listen to this message. This is like a little sidebar. If you're here this morning and you've trusted Christ and his Holy Spirit resides in you, he's given you a gift or giftings that he asks you to use in his service. Sometimes we doubt that. God, could you really use me? And he says, I can and I will. I've already qualified you to do it. The calling is the qualification, and he equips us along the way. I entered, entered into ministry over 20 years ago in a church, First Baptist Dover, in my home, in, in my home state of Florida. Um, and I grew up there. That's where I was married. That's where my parents were married. My dad was a deacon. I learned a lot there. But I entered into ministry doing something very different from what you see me doing here. I did not preach. As a matter of fact, my first sermon was six pages of manuscript, and it took me six minutes in the youth group. I was terrified the whole time. I was 19, but my primary job was to hold a guitar behind a microphone and lead worship. That was my responsibility. I entered into ministry as a worship leader. Then along the way, I was mentored by people in the church. I was developed. I was discipled. But I had all the same excuses that a lot of folks do sitting in the pew. What in the world do I have to offer? I'm not gifted. I'm not equipped. I'm not qualified to do the thing. And I wanted to use that as an example that God does not necessarily call those that are qualified according to the world standards. He qualifies and equips those he calls. Will he use our lives as a vessel? Yes, he will if we allow him to. Jethro comes to his son-in-law who's given all the excuses. And Jethro comes and says, I'm going to praise the one who's done the work. So point number one, that leader multiplication is as timeless as scripture. This idea that within the body of Christ or within any social construct that leaders would pop up, I would submit that this is as timeless as scripture, that leaders would come up from within. We develop our own, or we should. Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods because in this affair they dealt arrogantly with the people. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. Jethro starts where we should all begin. You heard, in this, you heard in the video from Mark that leadership, in order to be a leader, you have to know what it is to follow. Jethro casts Moses' gaze where it should be, not necessarily to his efforts and his, and his abilities, but in the God who led him to do the thing that he had done, led them out. Leadership begins at the feet of the Father. He gets the glory, not the leader. 
Jethro helps us all after he says it to his son-in-law in a very interesting conversation. Hey, I don't want you to think too much of yourself because he's the one who did it. So let's go worship him. So he goes, he offers the burnt offering. Aaron comes with all the elders. They eat and they celebrate. And then in verse 13, this, this narrative takes a turn. The next day, Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you're doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning until evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another, and I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. Moses gives his father-in-law the story. This is what's happening. I've had to deal with these people and they're grumbling. Now I've got to deal with them as they deal with their disputes and tell them what God says. And It's a lot. So Jethro tells him, hey, God did this thing. He's given you the opportunity. Let's worship him. Let's, let's revert back to this idea that he wants you to do the thing, but he's going to get, he's going to equip you and he's equipped you to do it. But here's some additional information in the middle of this story. Can you imagine for yourself? It is your job to decide the disputes of everyone around you all day long. Any of you sound, feel drained by that already? <laughs> yes. It's tiring, but he doesn't say I'm tired. In, in, this, in the middle of this story, you got two, there's two different dynamics going on. Jethro says, look, God did this for you and he's at work. And, and then Moses goes the next day and he starts doing the same thing. He's doing hearing and, and giving the statutes of God to the people because they're asking him. He's functioning, but he's functioning and he's not functioning well. Point number two, leader multiplication is not a corporate strategy. Now, I've, I've worked for different places, different organizations, different corporations before I was in ministry. And one of the things that they always harped on was that we needed to develop as leaders. We need to develop, train new people, always going through training. There's always some type of training to take, always some video to watch, some notes to take, a class to attend. There's always a way to grow. But leader multiplication is not simply a corporate strategy. It wasn't thought up by a business. It was thought up by... By Jethro. Look at what Jethro says. Verse 17. Moses' father in law said to him, What you are doing is not good. Okay, so we know the context father in law and son in law. Son in law is doing a thing, doing the job. Father in law comes in, brings the family after they've gotten to where they're going to camp, and he says, Hey, why are you doing that? Like, and Moses gives him an answer, and Jethro answers him back. There's this. It may have been uncomfortable, maybe not, but there's this receptivity that, that Jethro is asking of Moses. He says, I need you to hear what I say. He said, what you're doing is not good. You, are, you and the people will certainly wear yourselves out for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. There are moments in the context of what we do as Christians where the things we carry are heavy, Right? I'll tell you one that's heavy going on. You see me with these up here on the stage, right? Some of the folks that are laughing more loudly have seen this happen over time. Uh, something happens when you reach a certain age. Your eyes don't work the way they should. And you have to put these things on called glasses to help you see. So sometimes my eyes get a bit more tired and I need my glasses. Well, just so happens this last week... I had to wear them because I can't read the text in my Bible very clearly without my glasses now. It's a thing. It's happening. I'm admitting it. I'm getting older. And it was the most encouraging moment in our small group when everybody said, oh, look at the glasses. <laughs> Some things you're just not meant to bear alone. So thank you to my small group for helping me bear the weight of having to wear my glasses. It's super, I felt super encouraged by that. We talked about the importance of small groups last week, right? Being with people, being in community, growing in the word together, letting them encourage you. Sometimes that encouragement comes, you know, by way of glasses that you have to wear now. But sometimes hearing things, walking life out with people is more in depth than just glasses. It's the loss of a, of a parent. 
or it's I lost my job, or we're having to move. Or maybe it's a celebration where we live life together, or maybe there are moments when disputes arise among friends that you have to step in. Maybe you're the peacemaker. Jethro looks at his son-in-law and he says, hey, this is going to exhaust you because you're not built to carry that by yourself. I've given you people. I've given you people. So look at what he says later in verse 18. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Now obey my voice. I will give you advice and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God and you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. He says, moreover, look for able men and all the people from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens, and let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter they shall decide themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. They will bear the burden with you. They will hold your hands up when you are tired. They will encourage you along the way. You will grow together as a community, as leadership is shared, as this responsibility of caring for and shepherding is is shared. Why a message from Exodus on leader multiplication? Because Paul takes us into a process of what that should be. But here's the point of Jethro to his son. Sharing the load is the purpose And sharing the joy is the goal. As we spend time as Christ followers, as Christians, doing life in church, and as we look into what God's got in front of us down the road, there is no telling where he's going to take each and every one of us in this room or us as a church corporately. He only knows that. We do our best to see what he has for us and and follow him where he's going. But I can tell you, that doing life together, sharing the responsibility and the ministry load is God's plan for his church. He's giving us opportunities to do so. And sharing the load is the purpose, but sharing the joy is the goal. What is the joy? What would joy look like if we were to share responsibility in ministry? Joy? Man, more disciples being made, more groups being started, churches being planted, or revival taking place in this area, this community of of Dayton, this suburb of Dayton, if you will, Kettering, Sugar Creek, Beaver, I don't know where we are anymore. It's all the same. But what would it look like if we shared the load? We go further, faster when we go there together. When we go there together. So sharing the load is the purpose, and sharing the joy is the goal. It's not simply, hey, let's make everybody's work easier. It's let's increase the joy by serving together. Leaders need a challenge to equip others well. This is for me. This is for me. This is for anybody who's ever led in ministry before, led a class, preached a sermon, taught something. Man, teaching two-year-olds. You just heard that. Teaching two-year-olds. They can hear what you're saying, but it involves the heart. But here's Our job, our job is to equip, to train, to build up the body. And I need a reminder, just like Moses did. Hey, this isn't going to work forever. You can't do this on your own. In verse 21, he says, look for able men. Paul echoes this to Timothy. What does he say? Entrust to faithful men who can further teach faithful men the truth that has been conveyed. The calling to develop leaders is not new. It's not corporate. It's not a business structure. It is a biblical process. So number next, number three, leader multiplication is a biblical process. It's rooted in scripture found there. If you turn with me to Ephesians 4, we're going to spend the bulk of our time back here now in this portion of scripture. In Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11, here's what Paul says to the church. 
Speaking of unity in the body of Christ and how we're supposed to build one another up. In verse 11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Man, that is a tall order. Do you hear all that? He gave people who had gifts, these gifts, shepherding, evangelists, prophets, teachers, with a purpose to shepherd, to teach, to train, to equip the body, to equip the saints, to do the work of ministry. What is the work of ministry? The work of ministry is growing in Christ. This is the whole, the whole point. He's got a group of people. We are the called together ones. Those God is called by his name. He said, I want, I want you to trust me. So here's the first step. We enter into a relationship with God through his son by asking for forgiveness for our sins, trusting him with for that forgiveness and entering into a new life. The Holy Spirit fills us. He gives us gifts and then he sends us out. We are declared saints as Christ followers. That's crazy to think about. Then he said, hey, I'm going to pull you together into a body called the church and that church has a mission. That mission, that purpose of the church is to go out and make disciples. There we go in the back. Make, yes, come on, I love it. Make disciples. They did not call the church together to say, hey, church, go hire a staff and we'll let them go do it. Ooh. He said, I'm calling the church together, spirit-filled believers. They're going to come together. They're going to worship together. They're going to study together. They're going to go out and make disciples to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So here's my question, number one. In the room, have you trusted Christ? Because outside of that, disciples make disciples. Are you a disciple of Christ? Are you a follower of Christ? Have you, have you entered into a relationship with him? That's step number one. You can attend church all day long. You can, you can come and sit in a seat and hear a message and sing some songs and pray some prayers. But you're not part of the body of Christ outside of a relationship with his son. Uh, you got to be in a relationship with Jesus to be a part of the body. We are the body of Christ, the representation of Christ on earth. That is who we are. And without a relationship with him, you're, you're an attender. So first, this faith family, we belong to him. We are his body. And he, he further says, what does he say? so that we may no longer be children. This is the purpose of the gifting of people to the church, to teach, to train, to equip. This is the disciple-making process. Verse 14, look at what it says. So that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. We need each other to stand. We need to be equipped to stand, trained to stand, taught to stand fast. He says, this is disciple making. Disciple making is more than inviting someone into the baptistry waters and walking away. Matthew 28. Let's go ahead and flip there really quick. I'm, I'm ahead, but I got to read it. Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. Jesus speaking to his disciples. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Make disciples. He didn't say Go get a bunch of converts. Make disciples. And what, how does he say it's supposed to look? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. It's baptizing and teaching. Baptizing and teaching. And what does that teaching look like? When he says make disciples, as you are going, make disciples. Every step Every breath, every meal, every conversation, that's my life. As I'm sitting in my office, as I'm counseling somebody, having coffee, I'm in the gym, I'm, what, I'm doing whatever I'm doing, I'm teaching a class. Make disciples. Then he, he says, this is how we know they belong to us. We're going to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we're going to teach them. None of us arrive fully formed in Christ. Let me say that again. 
None of us arrive fully formed in Christ. There is a process by which he makes us fully formed. And Paul just said it. He says, we're going to all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We're going to do that together. There are going to be folks that God gifts to your life to teach, to train, to disciple. And there are going to be folks that God trusts to you as a disciple maker to teach, to train, to disciple. See, the challenge and the task of disciple making doesn't rest simply on those who bear a title. The title of Christ follower is enough. So question number two, if you're a Christ follower, are you making disciples? If you're a Christ follower, are you making disciples? The evidence of my life of being a Christ follower behind me should be a long line of people who said, I I believe I've trusted in Christ. What kind of legacy of faith am I leaving outside of a lot of disciples of Christ? A lot of plaques on the wall and our name and lights in different places. But I'd rather know that I was faithful to do the thing, the only thing God called me to do, is to make disciples. So leader multiplication is a biblical process, and it begins with point number four. Leader multiplication is disciple-making. So let's look at Ephesians 4, verse 1. I'm going to go back as Paul introduces this idea of unity. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit, and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. If we add verse 7, here's what ties it all together. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of of Christ's gift. And then he enters into this conversation of how God has gifted the church, his bride, his body, us, to do the thing he's calling us to do. I have a quote that I wanted to share from a book called Designed to Lead. You notice I have a stack of uh, books up here. These are teaching aids. This is just a sample of what has been written on disciple making and leading and leadership development. There, there are thousands upon thousands of volumes that have been written on this topic. Here's my question. How many more books need to be written about this topic before we will lean into what God's called us to do and get after it? What needs to go away for us to do it? I I brought this up here just to show you. These are some, and and in this book, Designed to Lead by Eric Geiger and Kevin Peck, some some great guys wrote a a biblical treatment and gives us a good theology of leader development. Here's what they said. It'll be on the screen. Leadership development, apart from being a disciple of Jesus, always results in skills apart from character and performance apart from transformation. Should hold on to those words for just a second. If all we're about is developing skills in someone's life rather than forming the heart through the Word of God, then we'll have some really skilled people that are going about doing a task. But if it's about if it's about transformation, then the results will follow. Can I tell you what God has for us in the future? I have no idea. I've been here for almost 10 years, and it's been a roller coaster of a ride since I got here. Started as a youth pastor in 2013. Three different titles. Moved around the building a little bit. But one thing is, one thing is certain. The people of God armed with the Spirit of God can fulfill the mission of God. And I really believe in this room There are people sitting in the seats that someone has never looked at them and said, I know you have it in you. I know God's gifted you. Maybe you're great at hospitality. You love to host people, right? Do it. Invite them to your home. Cook a meal. Welcome them to church. Welcome them to your small group. Let them hear what God has done through your personal testimony. You know one place that testimony or testimony, hospitality is really practical. How many of you walked in this morning and were greeted by somebody when you walked in? Just show me a hand real quick. Somebody said, hey, good morning. It's good to see you. 
How cool is that? Somebody smiles at you on a rainy Sunday. They had to think about that statement. It's good to see you. Good morning. Or you got coffee from the area outside, right? You got co- raise your hand if you got coffee. That starts very early in the morning. And when you empty one of those things, they smile because they got to make another one. Right? Give me a smile on a Sunday morning. Help me feel welcomed. Make me know that you're glad that I'm here. Some of you are really gifted at that. You smile a lot. Put your hand out, shake somebody's hand. It's good to see you. Glad you're here. Welcome to worship. Maybe you would say on a Sunday where it's raining, it'd be great to have an umbrella. Amen? Was it raining when you got here? It was raining this morning. Man, how neat would it be to have people say, on the days that it's raining, you can count on me to hold an umbrella to welcome somebody to the building. Or you're gifted to teach. You love to teach. You love to train. You love to equip. You love to take the word of God and help people understand it. We got all kinds of needs for small groups around this place. There are people eager to get into a group. It's time. What are we waiting on? Maybe I need to share my faith more. I need to be more bold. I remember when we were getting ready to have kids, people would ask, are you ready? And what do you say? Well, yeah, you're not ready. Nobody's ready. If you wait till you're ready, you never will. Church, what are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? It's clear. We have, a, we have a purpose. We have a mission. And like he says, if all we're doing is, is gaining more knowledge and never giving that knowledge away, we're going to sit and sour. That knowledge is going to go, it's just going to sit there. But he's given us knowledge, empowered by his Holy Spirit to be sent out to take that knowledge and, and make an impact. Kingdom impact. Not just here. Maybe God's calling you to go plant a church overseas somewhere or down the street. You're going to leave here in a couple years and you're not coming back. That's awesome. Go where God calls you to go. Go take the gospel somewhere where it hasn't been heard yet or go plant a church in a neighborhood where the gospel witness has gone dark. Because here's what he says. If, if this is done collectively as disciple making, the natural overflow of disciple making is disciples who make disciples. And you can't keep that quiet. Disciples who make disciples, you can tell. And they got a different bounce to their walk when they walk in. They're the people greeting you before the greeters get to greet them. You ever know, you ever know those people? Like they're excited about life. They just led somebody to Jesus. They're going to tell everybody about it. Or they had five new people show up to their small group. Or they've invited people into their home. Or they're doing something. They're about making disciples, intentionally investing. Here's a couple things for us to consider. Paul gives us this really good picture. We are the body of Christ together. We have a job. And later on in this passage, look at what he says. In verse 8, Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, led a host of captives, and he gave gifts To men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? That he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. And then he continues, he gives us these gifts. He gives us the apostles, the prophets, the shepherds, the evangelists, the teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And skipping down, down here to verse 14, that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. You may not be a teacher. You may not be a missionary. But you can run a vacuum. You can sweep the floor. You can serve a table. That's what the body does. We move together when we are equipped to do so, given opportunities. Down at the bottom of your worship notes, if you have the paper notes from your worship guide, go ahead and take those out for me real quick. And this is okay. This is where it's okay to not be looking at the sermon notes on your phone, whoever you are. That was for free. Take your camera and scan that QR code. That's going to take you to a spiritual gifts test. I had conversations with folks, and there's lots of opportunities. I just don't know how God's built me to serve. I don't know what he's gifted me to do. Well, here's a good chance to take a quick assessment. It takes about two minutes. It's going to give you your top three. 
with those top three, we would love to know what you see, what that test has revealed. Maybe, hopefully, you answer honestly to the questions and let this thing do its work and give you your top three. And we will say, hey, there's some great opportunities based on your top three gifts for you to jump in and be a part of what's going on around here. There are huge opportunities, huge opportunities. And here's the deal. Looking back in Exodus real quick, here's why ministry leadership is hard to be shared. Because in the very beginning, Jethro gives us the point of ministry leadership being shared for God to get the glory. It is very, very selfish of a ministry leader to withhold leadership opportunities from his church. And it's very, very uh, selfish for those who are gifted in leadership that are sitting and not doing anything with it to withhold their leadership from the church as well their involvement. So I want to ask you to consider from those top three, what has God gifted you to do? Because we are the body of Christ. We move together. The church is a spirit-filled body. We heard Acts 1-8 last week, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The only requirement to share the gospel is be filled with the Spirit after trusting in Christ. That's the only requirement. Go and share. Now, are there tools to be equipped to do so? You can certainly use the three circles. You can use the gospel project information. You can use whatever tool helps you have a conversation. But you got to have the conversation. Be his witness. We are gifted to do that. Finally, the church is God's mechanism for kingdom advancement. I heard this years ago, and it never, I never got over it. I heard a preacher say the church is God's plan A to make disciples. There is no plan B, right? Spirit-filled Christians who are walking with Jesus, he's given us a task. Look at Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Behold, I am with you always even to the end of the age. The church has been set apart for ministry. When I say church, we're talking big C, the body of Christ. Those who belong to him, those who have trusted Christ and you're a part of the body of Christ, we have been set apart for ministry. You're like, I, don't, I don't get a paycheck for being a missionary. That's fine. If you're a missionary, where you get a paycheck from? Be a missionary in your neighborhood. Those neighbors that ask you for sugar every week. Tell them about Jesus. Invite them in. Walk your neighborhood. I, we had some, some really, really interesting things happen when you have a dog and you're on a walk. Well, if there's another dog, the walk's over, right? It's just not happening, at least with our dog. But people talk to you. They want to talk to you about your dog. What kind of dog is he? Is he, you know, how old is he? He's really, you know, he's awesome, really friendly. We had a conversation just yesterday on a walk early in the morning with a nice lady in our neighborhood. And she's listening to some praise music. Sweetest lady, so nice, talked about how cool he was. And I said, ma'am, it's so good to hear what you're listening. She said, she said it fuels me every day. Truth washing. Man, willingness to be present where you go. We are set apart for ministry. The church does ministry together. You saw that, Acts 2, 42 to 47. If you didn't see that last week, put a finger there. Acts 2, 42 to 47. That's the body of Christ at work, doing ministry together both within and outside the walls. And finally, the church has a purpose that is greater than performance. All of this, the lights, the screens, the instruments, all of that stuff, can go away, and our purpose is the same. The purpose is to make disciples. And as we make disciples, guess what happens? They make disciples. And from those disciples come more disciples. And within all of those disciples come those leaders that God is going to send in different places. We, as a church, are committed to walking a disciple-making process to see leaders fully formed, be sent out in different places for ministry and mission. I hope you are as excited about it as I am. I want to read one last thing to you before we close. It's a thought from a book on disciple making that I thought was really helpful as we close. Because some of us in this room, I'll be honest with you, I sat in a room like this for a long time, knowing that God was speaking to me, 
calling me to do something, and I was like, well, surely somebody else. Surely somebody else. And you need to be trained and equipped. I can, I'm good. And part of that is true. But God wants us to build our toolbox that he's given us. And here's what this says. Most ideas of disciple making is a class for a larger group for a short-term payoff. Give me a class for 10 weeks. 10 weeks, we're going to graduate from the class. We'll go to another one. But disciple making is focused on the person for the long run for fruit that will last. What will it survive? Time. Trial. The rejection of sharing when you share the gospel. The pain of broken relationships with family and friends. It will survive. If disciple making is focused on the person for the long run and not for the masses on the short term, then disciple making naturally leads to the, to the development of more leaders in ministry. It's about heart transformation, not behavior modification. Because behaviors shift, but behaviors come from the heart. So when we talk about leader multiplication and walking this process out as it is, as it is disciple making, we need to understand that the Holy Spirit fills us and God shapes and he does so in the body of Christ. So I, for one, am excited to see how God takes a disciple-making process and spits out leaders to take the gospel to the streets and to the nations. Because that's the mission he's called us to as a church. This is a, a, a passage, a, a, a lesson, a sermon that took a long time for the Lord to penetrate my heart with because I was one of those leaders that wanted to hold on to leadership as long as I could. <laughs> My identity is in Christ. And I pray that we as a church, in person and online, would lean into the process that God has before us of growing his disciples and being developed for the ministry he has for us. Let's pray together.